Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about refugees and universities. Dr. Dorian B. Crosby teaches in the Political Science Department at Spelman College. Her Introduction to Refugee Studies class educates the Spelman community about issues affecting today's refugees. Dorian's research interests include women refugees, particularly resettled refugee women. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks again for coming on. Uh, Dorian, if you wouldn't mind saying a word or two, what is a refugee? What's the definition of a refugee? Well, the internationally accepted definition of a refugee comes from the United Nations. And it is one that involves a person who has to flee their country because of fear of persecution based on race, religion, political origins, or political affiliations, religious ideas, political ideas. So anyone who is uh, fearful of their lives, they flee their country, and that means that they have crossed borders. And those borders can be very close in proximity to the country where they are, or they can be thousands of miles away. But usually a refugee, the internationally accepted definition, is one that means this is a person who um, feels that there will be harm done to them if they remain in their home country and they leave their home country. Of course, that definition has expanded to include environmental issues and natural disasters, but originally from the 1951 convention and the 67 UN protocol, it really did define what internationally people accept and countries accept now as a refugee. Well, you mentioned a person who's fearful. Is What happens if somebody is hypersensitive or hyper fearful? Is there such a thing or uh, how do we define who's being too fearful or who's not being fearful enough? Well, usually there are criteria that the United Nations sets forth and it means that there are studies into your background, that there are really hard founded reasons that we can document, we I say is in the United Nations, can document to say that you have a truly found need to get out of your country. So there's an extensive amount of research that's done to your claim that you can no longer remain in your home country or you have to leave. And remember, the, again, this is based on the political reasons, but definitely not for natural disasters. Fair enough. And how many refugees are there in the world right now? Right now, there are roughly around 47 million refugees. Um, so there, there are a lot. You said 47 million refugees yes. in the world right now? Yes, there are a lot of refugees. And this, of course, includes displaced persons as well. And so to just explain, when we talk about forced migration or displacement, we are talking about people who have to leave their countries, which is different from immigrants. And those are persons that we typically define as persons who leave their countries or their home countries by choice. But a refugee is someone who has to leave their country. So remember, we're talking natural disasters, environmental reasons, political reasons, and that's why that number can be so high. And also because we see so many conflicts in the international arena that occur so frequently and so quickly sometimes. As right now, we're looking at the situation in Mali. And there are thousands of people who are going to be uprooted because of the unrest there. But again, that's a mostly political reason. Well, but let's, that's an interest, interesting point. So let's assume that you're right, that there are thousands of people, if not you know, tens of thousands of people in Mali who are going to be displaced because of the fighting. Where do they go? Usually, or normally, they go to the country that's right next to them, that's very close. And that can be problematic also because the neighboring country might also be engaged in conflicts or may also be experiencing their own types of natural disasters. And so many countries are engaged in generating as well as receiving refugees, which again can drain their own resources, which is why it becomes a more international issue. Well, do universities do anything or a lot of things about this? Most universities globally do, particularly those universities or institutions of higher education that are within countries that generate and receive uh, lots of refugees. But those that may not receive that many uh, might not be as knowledgeable about refugees as most countries or as most universities within those close proximities of those immediate areas are. But in the United States, most colleges and universities are aware, but perhaps at different levels of awareness. Well, if you don't mind me asking you about Spelman. Sure. Because I, I know you went to school there and yes. you teach there. Yes. Uh, so how does somebody from Mali 
or somewhere else in the world get to Spelman? So first of all, if the institution of higher education has a process where they accept resettled refugees, and again, this is on the end process of forced migration. There are, very, there are different phases. Um, and so when they are in the resettlement phase, that's pretty much the last phase, so to speak, because it means that they are now in a country that has accepted them, and they're trying to get them adjusted to that country and to that culture. So every state or every country has its own rules and regulations as to who is allowed into the country. And then every state within the United States has their own process of how they accept or whether or not they accept resettled refugees, because remember, they aren't citizens. So a lot of avenues and opportunities aren't open to them in terms of funding and education. So if a student comes from Mali and they want to continue their education, they have to go through the process of becoming a person who is accepted as a refugee, first of all, by the United Nations, and secondly, by the United States, and then thirdly, there are funding opportunities that perhaps the local communities, civic organizations, religious organizations will offer them. But typically, some colleges may not offer that, such as a scholarship. And Spelman, to my knowledge, is not one of those institutions of higher education that would offer a scholarship to a resettled refugee, although there are those institutions that exist. And I assume, because you teach this, that you probably have your hand on, uh, on, on the levers of, of interest at Spelman. Have you ever discussed with anybody in the administration about whether or not maybe Spelman should take one or two slots a year and reserve them for resettled refugees? Well, we're taking gradual steps. Spelman is very involved in our community. As you know, most historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, are embedded in the communities that bore them. And so the historical link between the surrounding communities and that institution is very strong and it continues to be so and Spelman is no exception to that. And so we understand that in order to reach out and to assist the communities, not tell them what they need to do, but to help them with the work that they're already doing, we offer those services through the Bonner Scholars Program and they've been extremely helpful with me and my refugee class. But Spelman is involved also in making sure that students that graduate have a global education and that means that not only are they able to travel abroad, maybe with a study abroad program, but also maybe to just take a class or the curriculum that exposes them to international issues and resettle refugees or the broader issue or arena of forced migration is certainly one of those areas. Well, you know, you mentioned forced migration. Um, you know, I recently went to a Hugh Masekela concert, mm -hmm. uh, and he called it Songs of Migration. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating in that he, his argument, you know, obviously through music, uh, was that this was a form of force. And that this force was something that was a political force in the world that had to be corrected. The music, you mean? Well, his, yeah, he was, he was talking about forced migration oh. as, as songs of migration, that the songs were reflecting the force of migration. Yes, and that's where, when we talk about forced migration again, um, the discussion has expanded because in, originally it was a very narrow definition, as I said, of a political um, issue, and now it's expanded a lot to include economic issues. And that's also one of the reasons why that's important that we make the distinction between migrants and forced migrants. So some of the issues that are contained in the South African saga are those of people who must leave their countries such as Zimbabwe and come to South Africa or South Africans leaving South Africa to go somewhere else to seek better economic opportunities. And although that is a form of migration, some would say it's forced migration if you as a person or your particular group is excluded from opportunities to advance yourself economically within your, your particular country. That's interesting. Well, speaking of the economic issues, there's a lot of political pushback, as you well know, about students who are not U.S. citizens being able to get in-state tuition rates at a number of universities around the country. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that given that there's so much political pressure to, to, to not do that or to do that, that you could see how some people would say, well, if we're, not, if we're gonna spend X amount of dollars on students who are not U.S. citizens, now you're asking us to spend more dollars on students who are coming from other countries and aren't even citizens of, of, of a different, or, or, or now are not even citizens of that, their former country anymore. 
Well, it's, it's definitely an economic discussion. Um, but I think what we have to remember is that resettled refugees really more than often are here because they have no other choice. Um, they don't have a recourse and many of them come having experienced and seen atrocities that no human being should ever have to experience. And so yes, the argument there for viability and accessibility of resources is, is definitely a valid one. But when we talk about resettled refugees, we go back to that definition, the initial definition, and even the expanded one that focuses on the fact that you really are here because you don't have a choice. There is no home to return to. And so we kind of have to find a balance to make sure that we are trying to meet the needs of those who are trying to extend their education through issues and circumstances of no fault of their own, but at the same time making sure that we have ample resources to meet those needs. I could see how that would be a tough challenge mm -hmm. if you're an administrator at a university, uh, but I, I guess I, I wonder what our responsibility is as either a person, as a human, as uh, an institution. Right, if there are 47 million refugees, mm -hmm. that's a lot of people. It's, it is. Okay, and some of our universities are perhaps not as rich as they'd like to be, but certainly have a lot more resources than people who have zero dollars coming, who have just been forced out given a war in a particular country. Mm -hmm. How can we create a situation whereby universities devote more resources to this? Well, I think it is something that would have to start from a discussion of who's involved, and that would begin um, obviously with faculty or staff. If there are persons at the institution that have disclosed their status, that maybe they themselves are resettled refugees, you can start by talking to them to find out what the needs are in terms of matriculating as a student, fitting in as a student, um, accessing resources, navigating American culture as a student or even as a, an adult, a faculty member or a staff member. And then take those discussions to administrators and get them to understand that um, resettled refugees are positive contributors to our societies and they are positive contributors to our campus, immediate campus environments as well as the surrounding communities. So anything we can do to help facilitate their adjustment process is not only going to be better for that particular individual but also for the campus community itself because it gets educated in the process but also for the external communities that the resettled refugees are attached to, which means they're capable now of taking more skills, resources that they've attained through the university experience or the college experience and help ev uh, um, others within their own communities. Well, and I wonder if maybe we, we're, we keep talking about students, but maybe we should also be talking about staff and faculty as well, mm -hmm. because not every person who's a refugee is necessarily going to be a student, of course. Right, correct. Um, and that's another issue when we talk about the adults, that there are certainly other issues that adults must contend with, um, particularly since over 80% of refugees, which is a person who is within a refugee camp, a resettled refugee is someone who has actually gotten you in um, assistance based on that definition to leave the refugee camp. So a refugee is someone who still resides within the refugee camp and is still receiving assistance from non-governmental organizations or NGOs or even intergovernmental organizations which are IGOs. And so when we talk about getting um, a perspective on what refugees are and how they get into the United States, there are definitely issues that adults contend with, particularly if we're talking about the refugees, which over 80% of them are women. And so they perhaps have dependents on either end of the age spectrum. They may have elderly folks that they're looking after. They may have young children that they're looking after. So it definitely becomes an issue of engaging that resettled refugee, him or herself, to find out what their specific needs are and then trying to match them with, with what the university or the college can, can offer. Fair enough. You just said something a second ago that was interesting. 80% of refugees are women? Yes. Why? Because typically in um, most countries around the world, it, uh, the structure of the society is patriarchal, which means it usually benefits men. And then sometimes the cultural issues are intertwined or they are manipulated and then they become institutionalized and then everything about society is for the benefit of men with the exclusion on different levels of exclusion of women. Now obviously these things are changing but typically we see um, when there are conflicts, meaning wars or civil wars, the men 
are the ones who usually end up killed, kidnapped, maimed, and they are typically the ones in these patriarchal societies that are the protectors and the providers of their households. So once you remove that male from that household, the woman then has to step into a role of being now the provider and the protector of her family, which she may not be accustomed to. And that's not to exclude the fact that some women um, in certain cultures don't have a problem with being the person that is not responsible for that. So we want to be sure that we are careful with the Western idea of the male and female gender roles uh, within the, the family structure. But this is why we tend to see many women that are refugees because the men are the ones that have been engaged in the battle. And again, this is a political conflict. Now with natural disasters or environmental or climate disasters, uh, it is no respecter of gender. So when we talk about that 80% or the over 80%, we really are really talking more specifically about the political conflicts. Well, that's, that, that's really interesting. I, I wonder if women's colleges in particular have, or have been or should be doing more about this then. Well, there definitely are many women's colleges that are engaged. Um, and if I could just speak specifically back in Georgia, where I'm from, which I know the most about, um, which would be Spelman College, of course, and Agnes Scott College. And for us at Spelman, it really is, um, it fits perfectly into our mission of engaging and educating women of African descent, but of course we're open to all women of any background. But our mission uh, from our start in 1881 was to make sure that women of African descent were educated and that they were educated to become leaders and to of course change the world. So it fits perfectly with our mission of making sure that women, we have a women's resource center that's run by Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal, was started by her also. So we have women that come from various cultures just to partake of the resources that we have that are centered and focused on women. Right now we actually have a young student um, who's from Syria and so she's pretty much getting the college engaged in looking at refugees in Syria. So all of it is very much connected and as I said there, there's a lot that the women colleges can do and are doing to make sure that women themselves are educated in the United States or if you are unaware of the issues surrounding forced migra migration and resettled refugees that you become aware of them and then you, you know your options of how you can help. And that can go anywhere from volunteering to perhaps donating what few dollars you may have as a college student. Well, and which, which organizations uh, are particularly effective in the United States in terms of helping uh, refugees? Well, there are many organizations and because the United States is structured as a federal government, um, our assistance and how we accept refugees is also based on that division of powers. So when we talk about the assistance, it comes from the international level and then it comes from the national level for us, in the United States, and then on the state level. So on the state level, we have the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, which is um, one of the organizations that's connected to the United States um, Department of State. And they work to help get resettled refugees into the United States. Once they're in the United States, um, state organizations are then provided the names and their, the information on the refugees that are coming to the United States that we've accepted. And then those local organizations are very much involved, primarily so than any of the other organizations, in ensuring that the refugees are resettled. And that means um, helping them to learn English, acquire a job, perhaps um, help them understand and navigate daycare. Some cultures are very accustomed to leaving five and six year olds at home that can't have in the United States, so they have to be acclimated to laws, rules, regulations, and just the American culture. So there are numerous organizations. Um, the International Rescue Committee is also one of those that works on the national as well as the local level. Well, and, and in terms of the local issues, are what sorts of groups in particular rise to the challenge of raising money for refugees? Well, there are numerous groups that do this. Um, most often we see the volunteer agencies, or the short term of the acronym for that is VOLAGS, and volunteer agencies are the ones that really, really are working more closely with resettled refugees and in terms of ensuring that they are that they're paying their rent that they understand how to turn a stove on there's so many things that we take for granted in the United States and remember resettlement occurs all over the world so I'm just really speaking specifically from the United States perspective 
But there are so many things that we take for granted that we do every day that might be unfamiliar to some people who come to us from other cultures. And so it really is a daily effort to ensure that they are adjusting to America in the best possible way. That's a fair point. I, you know, as you were saying this, I'm thinking, well, how is somebody supposed to present a transcript to Spelman College if they don't even, if they've been forced out of their homes mm -hmm. and they have no resources and no money and they don't have a home anymore, mm -hmm. they're certainly not going to have in their back pocket a transcript mm -hmm. from somewhere. Mm -hmm. How do you know how much they've achieved academically? To be honest, you really don't. Um, obviously, they can tell you that they've reach a certain level of professionalism or skills in a particular area or a certain level of education. But unless you offer them some sort of placement test, maybe for that particular institution, uh, you really just have to take their word for it. Because again, in either a natural disaster or a humanly created disaster, people really don't have time to, as you said, gather up their belongings or find their certificates. They just leave uh, because they have to. And so with a, such an abrupt departure, you really don't have the necessary forms with you. And so every state, meaning every country, will have its own process of how they identify your levels of your skills and, and where you would be placed within a particular institution. And again, that also rests within the institution's criteria. So it really is, it is very stressful because with my work with resettled um, organizations in metropolitan Atlanta, we've had people who have come and they've been doctors or lawyers or have had nursing degrees in their home countries and when they arrive they don't have that paperwork, they don't have the certifications, so they have to start all over again in our American um, educational process and that, that adds to the difficulties of trying to adjust to a new way of life and a completely new um, culture sometimes. Well, you could see how this would be hard. I mean, even yes. just for a basic immigrant who has n is not coming under an emergency circumstance. Right, and I have right. a friend from Sri Lanka mm -hmm. who is actually a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people uh, don't necessarily treat him as a lawyer simply because he has an accent. Right. And, and, and he's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And he has a ton of resources. Right, right. right? And, but that's the person with resources. But we're, now we're talking about people who have, you know, far fewer resources. Exactly. And so it does make it much more difficult. And... That doesn't mean that people don't succeed, that we, we do have resettled refugees who struggle and they attain their new certificates um, with the help of American liaisons, persons in the communities, or just the average person who runs into them and realizes that they need a certain type of assistance and they help them. So they go on to perhaps regain or start a new um, profession or a new career, but at the same time understanding that all of that training may or may not have been lost, depending upon where they go to re-engage their educational process. Well, in terms of the educational process, is there some sort of uh, association or coalition of either professors or universities that care about refugees a lot? There, I'm not sure if there are any uh, specific academic um, organizations um, because as you mentioned earlier my primary area of research is resettled refugee women and I'm just now beginning to really look more into the issue of higher education because from my class um, I'm noticing that there's a need to do more research on refugees in higher education or resettled refugees in higher education but I'm sure that there is um, some information out there on organizations that might not necessarily particularly look at resettled refugees, but might look at immigrants. And oftentimes refugee issues are kind of clumped in with immigration issues. And so there might be some assistance there, but it might not necessarily be titled uh, resettled refugees. Fair enough. Well, we only have a few minutes left, Dorian. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about your research. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about your research and where you hope to take it in the next few years. Because you're a very young, articulate professor and uh, we wish you well, but we'd like to know if you don't mind just a little bit more about where you plan to take your research. Sure. Well, with the resettled refugee women's research, um, I'm currently looking at extending my work on my dissertation, which was on resettled Somali women who live in Clarkson, Georgia. And I want to extend that research and look at what is going on with the women, the community women, who were the liaisons into the community that helped me with my research, what is their relationship with the community? I think it's a very special one that hasn't really been tapped into. Um, what does that mean to say that 
as a woman from this particular community, I respect you enough to lead me and help, help me to navigate American society and American resources. So I'm working on that right now, as a matter of fact, um, to go back to the women that helped me with my dissertation and ask them their perspective on what it means to help the women that are coming into and continue to come into their communities. And of course, once I get that completed, I'm going to move into more research on uh, resettled refugees in higher education. Well, I look forward to that, and we look forward to your work in the future. So thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. If you would like additional information about Dr. Dorian B. Crosby, please visit spellman.edu. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.